Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my pleasure to be here again with you. We spoke uh, this morning and today about uh, technology platforms. We spoke about development. We spoke about regulatory complexity. I'll try to drive you across uh, manufacturing plant and speak about the management of quality for uh, for vaccines. So there are certain uh, specificities. Um, starting uh, with a picture to illustrate the specificities, you have here on the screen the the visual difference that we have between uh, an active ingredient for vaccines with uh, an antigens on the right and the usual chemical uh, active substance of, of, of the drug products. Visually, it makes uh, a big difference. So vaccines, uh, antigens are much bigger molecules. They are much complex. This is uh, visually visible on the screen. Uh, as a consequence, they are much harder to manufacture. Uh, they are much harder to characterize, difficult to formulate. This was mentioned uh, again today. Uh, this, uh, of course, we are uh, working on live uh, organism, uh, so there is uh, the, a need for containment to prevent spreading the viruses or bacteria uh, outside the factory. Uh, this has consequences on, on the cycle time and on, on cost to produce vaccines. So let's enter further into the factory, and this is a, a, a chart uh, summarizing the, the, the manufacturing process of the vaccine. So everything is starting uh, there on the, on the top um, uh, left uh, at step one uh, with the culture. Um, uh, so either fermentation, which is used for bacteria, or uh, cell culture to, uh, that, that is then infected with the viruses. In fact, uh, quality and manufacturing is starting before. Um, they are probably uh, in most of the vaccines more uh, approximately uh, 200 uh, materials used to support uh, this process that do not all uh, enter into the, manu the, the composition of the vaccines, but they are used to support this, uh, this process. Not um, a single material is authorized to enter into the production prior to have been successfully tested against specifications. Uh, and in fact, uh, we are not uh, allowed to supply raw materials uh, from uh, suppliers that have not been uh, approved uh, by quality uh, audits prior to be authorized to supply it. So when, when materials enter into the, the manufacturing process, so we start with step one, um, uh, we enter into the, those uh, either uh, fermentations or, or culture. Uh, as a result of that, we are then harvesting uh, at step number two um, uh, these materials. So this is a, a, a complex mix of the of the culture itself, uh, of the nutrient that has been consumed and rejected partially by the bacteria or by the viruses. So this complex mix that is visible in the flask there has then to be uh, purified. Uh, because this is not this substance that will inject uh, to, to patient for sure. Uh, you already noticed that uh, between each step, uh, so I, I, I said that we are starting with uh, testing each single raw material. After each step, there are a number of quality control tests that are completed to confirm that at the end of the step, we obtain the right material at the right quality uh, level in compliance with what was allowed into the a license uh, that was approved by health authorities. So uh, quality control after harvesting step. This complex mix has to be purified. So this is step number three. Uh, we use a lot of uh, technologies to purify, to separate the different components. Uh, so this is uh, uh, using either uh, simple filtrations or uh, centrifugation. Uh, or, or uh, osmosis, uh, so different uh, techniques, uh, in order to uh, reach uh, a, a significant and sufficient uh, level of purity for the antigens. It was mentioned this morning that we have made so much progress over the last decades in terms of purification that uh, now for some of the puri highly purified antigens, we have to add antigens to participate to the immunization of, of the patients or to... to to boost this, um, this immunization. After purification, again, uh, control to uh, make sure that we reach the right level of, of uh, uh, purification of, um, uh, and the right identity. Then this is followed by inactivation, if necessary, 
Of course, a key uh, test is done afterwards to confirm that uh, inactivation was perfectly uh, 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 completed. And then uh, we get this purified, inactivated, if necessary, uh, antigen, uh, where we can uh, start uh, to assemble together the different valences of, of, the, of the vaccine. Uh, those different antigens are then combined into step number six, that is uh, formulation. So this is where we mix uh, the active ingredient together with the different excipients. The role as a, in a classic uh, drug product, the role of the excipients is to participate, to allow the, the, the drug substance uh, to be um, uh, filled uh, uh, and, and to then be administered uh, to the patient and participates, of course, either to the efficacy or to the stability of the product. So uh, this formulation step is particularly important. I think someone mentioned this morning that this was a touchy step uh, to uh, develop uh, because of the uh, complexity uh, uh, of, the, of the antigens. Uh, uh, they are sensitive, I forgot to mention, uh, to temperature. They must be kept at 5 degrees, plus or minus 3 degrees, including during these steps. So this is, again, um, uh, one of the characteristics of the uh, manufacturing of, of vaccines. At the end of this formulation, you see that the arrow is changing the color. This is because on the first part, we, are, we were dealing with uh, uh, the biological part uh, of, the, of the process to then, in the blue part, uh, uh, start the, the usual uh, uh, finishing steps of a drug product, let's say, uh, with the constraints of, of the of uh, reaching uh, uh, sterility uh, for the product, uh, one particularity uh, we, you have perhaps observed here that uh, there are two controls: the usual ones in in, in orange, plus a, a, a red one. Uh, one particularity of the vaccines, as well as in most of the countries of uh, products derived from blood. There is, in addition to the testing that is done by the manufacturer, an in independent test that is completed by most of the authorities uh, of the countries of the world. So one of the tests, uh, one of these tests uh, or the samples are pulled uh, here after the completion of that um, uh, biological part of the process. Then uh, uh, we start the, the filling operations. Uh, this is an aseptic process. Uh, to get a sterile product. Of course, there is uh, quality control. So we feel uh, um, uh, either in, in vials or in syringe ready for injections. Some of the vaccines cannot be stored, are not stable enough to be stored in liquid uh, during uh, the shelf life. They have to uh, go through an additional step that is uh, freeze drying, uh, which means that afterwards, at the time of use, the vaccines will have to be reconstituted. Again, quality control and then the usual uh, uh, final steps, which is packaging either uh, in uh, uh, single, uh, single dose or, or multi-packs for uh, uh, vaccination centers uh, and are often uh, either multi-dose vials and multi-dose uh, packs like it was the case for, for COVID, for example. Then there is batch release. So this operation... Uh, is completed in France at a minimum by a pharmacist that will review all the data that have been gathered along that process, so manufacturing data, quality control tests, uh, results. These people check the compliance to the dossier that was approved by authorities. These people check the compliance to the pharmacopoeias and the compliance to the specifications. If all the conditions are reached, the vaccines will be released. If not, then the batch will be refused. Uh, at that step, again, there is an independent review of the batch record and test that is being done by health authorities. So there is a, a, a double and redundant batch release for vaccines. And then the distribution. So some figures, uh, I have insisted, I think, enough on, on the weight of the quality control across that, uh, that, that way. Uh, it represents approximately, and, uh, and again, it depends on the platforms, but approximately 70% of the time of, of the manu full manufacturing time. So this is extremely significant. 
Uh, and as part of that, um, uh, pediatric uh, vaccination combos are the ones that are the most representative of that uh, 70% of the time. Uh, the number of tests is extremely significant. Uh, depends again on the platforms and on the vaccines, uh, depending if this is a, a combination product or not. Uh, it can be uh, above 1,000 tests. I have another slide on that. Uh, and the duration for that, uh, bottom right, uh, from six months uh, to uh, approximately uh, three years. So six months for the usual, I'm not speaking about mRNA. It was said this morning, this was shorter. Uh, um, six months corresponds, uh, not by chance, this is by design because people worked on that. For the flu vaccines, I say by chance because otherwise we would miss every year the opportunity to vaccinate uh, people on time. Uh, 36 months is for the, the, the um, uh, pertussis containing uh, combos for, uh, for uh, immunization of, of children. So uh, the manufacturing of the vaccines is complex. We are uh, a kind of a high-tech biotech industry, uh, which necessitates uh, a specific know-how uh, to control during the manufacturing these um, uh, living uh, bacteria or uh, viruses. So this is a, a big challenge, of course, because we work on this uh, live uh, living stuff. Uh, there is a high variability and the need for uh, experience and control uh, to do this. So we, you can guess that we have uh, within our uh, research and development uh, uh, teams and, and factories for manufacturing and testing. Uh, a, a right, uh, a big range of, of uh, highly educated uh, people and skilled people to uh, manufacture this. This is one characteristic, uh, characteristic of vaccines, which makes the fact that we cannot, uh, this is one of the reasons that we cannot manufacture vaccines everywhere in the world. Uh, it needs a kind of uh, uh, environment. Uh, uh, so, for example, I'm from Sanofi Pasteur. We are based in Lyon. Um, uh, Lyon is a quite famous place uh, with the university, with hospitals, uh, and with the, the, the factory. There is Biomerieu uh, just near the fence uh, of Sanofi Pasteur for vaccines. Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of ecosystem that is necessary in addition to a high level of investment. Factories are extremely expensive. Uh, this is one of the reasons why you cannot find a factory for vaccines in every country. In order to absorb this complexity and the cost, uh, most of the manufacturers today, and we are only a few, uh, even if by chance with the COVID, uh, we, there were newcomers in the game, uh, but we are only a few because it, 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 this is extremely expensive in terms of capital investments and needing a lot of uh, conditions, uh, ecosystem around the factories to be able to uh, manufacture in compliance with uh, worldwide um, uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, so specific know-how. Uh, quality oversight, uh, there is quality control, but there is quality assurance, a list of requirements that are put into in place uh, in a preventive way in order to prevent issues to occur, to guarantee the quality of the product in addition to the confirmation by the tests. So to perform this, uh, for example, in our uh, three factories in France, there is more than 1,000 people uh, dedicated totally to quality. Any single pe people working in a factory is involved in the quality of the product, but there are people specialized like me and like some others uh, in quality. So, uh, and last point I already mentioned. So in addition to all these uh, measures uh, that are implemented into the factories, uh, there is this independent, redundant uh, testing and release by the health authorities. Uh, an interesting picture. So this is the, the example of an exavalent vaccine uh, combination uh, product for, for the children. So this is uh, designed to uh, uh, protect against uh, six diseases. So one single vaccine, six diseases. Uh, but uh, again, an illustration of the complexity. This is uh, nine antigens, not six. Uh, why? Because for, uh, for uh, pertussis, uh, there are two antigens. For polio, there are three, for example. Uh, to get that syringe in your hand to immunize someone, uh, it needs to pass uh, the, the simple way I, I explained. Uh, it necessitates approximately 50 different uh, steps uh, to manufacture. 
we are using approximately 223 uh, analytical methods to do the tests all, along, all along the way. And for that specific vaccines, uh, uh, this is more, uh, this is uh, 1,277 individual tests that are completed, that must be completed successfully. We must obtain results that comply to the approved specifications to allow the release uh, of the vaccines uh, to the market. So if with this, uh, you're not convinced that vaccines are safe, <laughs> then uh, I will call for a friend to help me to convince you. <laughs> um, other figures, uh, so all the steps I mentioned uh, are recorded. So there is a full traceability uh, across the two to three years to complete uh, manufacture and test. Um, you can see uh, that for the different antigens, the time necessary for the manufacturing is different. So this is another illustration of the complexity. For our uh, people working in supply chain, making the plannings, uh, this is a nightmare because uh, to get at the same time all the necessary antigens to manufacture the combo, they have to take into account the different durations, plus each single process has a different yields. So it means if you launch a manufacturing for 100 kilograms, Perhaps one will get a yield of 90%, perhaps the other one 75%, and this is variable with time. So for supply chain people, this is a kind of crazy, uh, crazy job. So all operations are recorded uh, into what we call the batch record. This is the document that will be reviewed by the pharmacist at the end of the process prior to the release. So this is approximately uh, 1,000 pages more than uh, or approximately 10,000 data that are entered uh, into this uh, document by 50 different people, either to enter the data or to participate to the double checks that are performed on each single data. Of course, we capitalize uh, today on computerized systems. Uh, so there are manufacturing execution systems, electronic batch record, which perform some of these uh, check uh, better than, than human. But, but then the pharmacist is there to uh, see the global uh, picture and challenge some of the, and make some correlations. So you could think that after the release, which was the final step before the distribution, my job and the job of my teams and my peers uh, across the industry is finished. In fact, not. Not yet. <laughs> it's never finished because then we restart. But uh, after release, there is still a significant list of activities that we continue. We perform uh, stability studies. This is a requirement of good manufacturing practices at a minimum of one batch every year to confirm that the product is stable and that the, the aging uh, profile of that batch is uh, compliant to what was submitted in the uh, license of the product uh, to the authorities. Uh, we have samples collected uh, for testing, but we keep samples uh, they are called written samples. And for example, in the U.S., there is a requirement to make a visual inspection of these samples every year. Um, we have pharmaceutical quality systems for quality assurance of the vaccine. Uh, we are uh, required by the GMPs, uh, so that this is the quality norm that applies to industry, uh, to review the efficacy of that system and improve it uh, every year if necessary. So there are management reviews to confirm that. We are doing the same for each single product, each single vaccine. So there is annually uh, a review that is done on all the batches that have been produced, making sure that there is no adverse trend, or if there are positive trends, trying to capitalize on it and to feed the continuous improvement loop that is uh, required by the authorities uh, to industry. Periodical revalidation, this is to uh, confirm periodically that the processes give regularly the expected results or the tests uh, regularly uh, uh, are, are regularly confirmed as reliable, let's say. Uh, then from the market, uh, if a, a, a client or if a patient or if a medical doctor, for example, has an issue at the time of the use, wrongly labeled or, or box partially uh, uh, defect, uh, visual defect on, on, on the box, uh, people can come back to us uh, with a complaint, uh, then our industry is expected to perform uh, an investigation and then an impact assessment uh, in order to, uh, again, feed the continuous improvement loop and or in the case there is a, a critical defect, 
that could uh, be uh, a risk uh, for patients uh, in terms of uh, efficacy or, or safety of the vaccines, then this could uh, drive to what happens from time to time, rarely, but uh, this is, again, required at the benefit of the patient. This is batch recall. So PTCs is one for quality defects, and, and you all know pharmacovigilance. Uh, we are uh, monitoring the, the effects, uh, adverse or positive effects or lack of effects of the, of the medicines uh, through this uh, pharmacovigilance. So all these operations and those long cycle times, very long compared to uh, chemical drug products, necessitate anticipation for sure. And this chart uh, is again an illustration for you to uh, to come to the, let's say, to, the, to, to re real facts. We are in 23. The vaccines that you can get uh, right now um, uh, have started their life in our factories in 2020 uh, for the, again, the, the pediatric uh, combos. The ones that are manufactured today at the factory will be available to you and to me uh, only in 2025. So uh, for sure, uh, you know, this, this means something, and we'll speak about that uh, in the next steps uh, for authorities uh, when they want to vaccinate and, and to protect their populations. So um, to summarize the first part, uh, one of the three challenges that we face is the complexity and the duration of the process already explained. There are two other ones that do not depend on industry uh, or not only. Uh, there is one that is the, the demand that is difficult uh, to uh, anticipate. Uh, and in front of this demand that is variable and not always anticipated, and this is why I was underlining the, 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 the need to anticipate, uh, we are still a limited number of uh, vaccine producers uh, complying to uh, international uh, regulations and quality requirements. And the third one, was started to be discussed just before. This is the regulatory complexity. I will give you two examples. There is this famous uh, batch testing and release by the health authorities, which is, of course, in principle, good for the patient. This is to protect, but could have some adverse effect. Uh, and, and the post approval changes. So there is the initial license submission, but each time that you improve a process or a quality method, uh, quality testing method, you should submit a variation to the license. And this is complex. I will tell you why. So let's start with the batch release. Uh, so um, uh, I will speak about uh, vaccines produced in Europe, to take an example. So those vaccines are tested by the European authorities. So by chance, uh, again mentioned just before, uh, there is a mutual recognition within Europe and, and a little bit more, there's 27 countries plus uh, for the 131 uh, as part of this uh, space, recognize uh, this test and release by one authority. Uh, so uh, this is applicable to the to the top uh, there, so EU countries. Uh, there are some countries around the world that recognize uh, this European batch release. So this is good. But there is uh, still a significant uh, number of countries that want to repeat again uh, the tests that are already being completed by industry and by one uh, uh, stringent health authority. Uh, so um, I don't have, uh, this is a, a figure from a competitor, but uh, I think they mentioned, I didn't put it on the slide, that some of their vaccine, uh, 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 the same lot, could be tested six different times. Because uh, who pays for the test? This is industry, uh, it depends on the countries. It depends on the countries. In certain countries, you have to pay fees. In other countries, you have to supply the, uh, the reagents uh, and the reference standards and a certain number of things. So this is, it depends. Uh, this is not harmonized. This is the key of the point. <laughs> this is, okay. Uh, so uh, there is this uh, third control, which can be of a concern when you know that testing is the most significant part of the time. So this additional or this additional testing could delay vaccine availability or could take the, could introduce the risk sometime that uh, the, the, the test could fail when it has passed all the, all the previous time due to the viability of the methods. Moving to the regulatory part, so the post-approval changes, so the variations to be submitted. So we are globalized companies. We supply worldwide. So uh, part of my portfolio is, uh, is exported into uh, 150 uh, countries. 
uh, by lack of chance, uh, regulatory uh, approvals are nationalized. There is no regulatory harmonization. It was started to be discussed just before. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, when there are crises, uh, people start to uh, discuss together, but the, the way is still uh, uh, significant. Uh, I will not restart the previous discussion. The, the depths of the ocean, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, to illustrate uh, those difficulties, uh, uh, let's take an example, uh, one example, uh, uh, one antigen uh, for Sanofi Pasteur and, and for the, some of the competitors is entering into uh, seven, uh, uh, several vaccines. Uh, so let's take the example of the polio antigens. This is entering into the composition of eight of our vaccines. This represents worldwide 596 different licenses. So you already start to understand where we are going with this. And where we are going is the fact that the requirements for the content of these dossiers and the requirements for the context of these variations are not the same. So, uh, of course, industry, we try to group uh, uh, the different changes uh, that we are making into uh, uh, the same submission to save time. So this is the example here of a manufacturing capacity increase together with other changes. So this variation is affecting seven products. They are li licensed in 138 uh, different countries. And guess what? As part of these countries, there are 39 uh, in, in, in where uh, there is no requirement for reporting of the change. There are 37 countries that consider that change as minor. And there are 36 that consider uh, as major. Oh, oh, yeah. And this is just the beginning of the joke uh, because... <laughs> because the conclusion of the joke is on, on the right there. As part of these countries, and this is a real example, and not a, a story like this, this is a real life. Uh, 22 countries raise 107, uh, 177 questions, out of which only 19 were different. So at the end, for which benefits? Uh, so a lot of time consumed for all the parties, at the expense of the patient, because waiting for the, those questions to be answered, the patient doesn't benefit of innovation. That's it. And, and uh, not only doesn't benefit, but this is a, a, a chart that you can find on the IFPMA website. It shows the, the approval timelines up to four years in the different countries and the percentage here of countries where the change is approved. What we see here is that to get 50% of the countries or the equivalent of the population of the countries to accept the change, it takes two years. You have understood that the demand is highly variable. The consequence of this uh, duration uh, and, and the lack of predictability of the demand is that uh, for each change, we consider that 50% of the worldwide population is at risk of shortage due to those non-harmonized uh, regulatory processes that are consuming time and that delay uh, availability of vaccines. I think this is answering to one of the questions this morning, uh, not this afternoon. So this is a, a real uh, a real concern, a real risk. So uh, people, of course, start to discuss this. Uh, there is a dialogue uh, uh, to try to uh, decrease uh, this complexity in many fields, to try to encourage uh, reliance if this is not mutual recognition and seek for common solutions. Uh, in this field, uh, there is an enormous uh, support from WHO. Uh, this is an example of something that was released, I think it was at the end of 2021. Uh, a good collaboration of the WHO uh, Network for Biological Products which is coordinating, uh, um, I think, approximately uh, 40 to 50 uh, uh, national control laboratories um, um, uh, as part of the network. Uh, WHO has issued, in addition to their guidelines, uh, a leaflet promoting the global collaboration and reliance, as, as you can hear here, uh, as you can read here, uh, asking to improve procedures in order to recognize a test and a release that has already been done by a stringent health authorities from vaccines produced 
by uh, uh, what we call, what they call a quality assured uh, supplier. So conclusion, uh, we have a common interest, all parties, because we are all potential patients and want to be protected against those uh, vaccines preventable disease. Um, so interest into reducing this complexity to enhance innovation, to reduce the risk for shortages. There will still be shortages because of the variability for sure, but uh, uh, harmonization would help to decrease this risk. This would reduce the time to market. This would contribute to a more sustainable supply. Uh, we know that vaccination is a global need. Uh, it needs a global approach, not a national one. So this is a cooperation, all parties together, and an early cooperation between all the parties uh, are key. Uh, industry, uh, um, we want to be uh, recognized uh, as public health partners. This is one of the reasons why, uh, some, since some years, I'm accepting these types of invitations to uh, discuss with you. Uh, I think the dialogue is key and we have to cooperate in routine uh, and not to wait for a crisis and, and, uh, and pandemic uh, to start discussing because this is always too late. That's it. Thank you very much. So we have about 15 minutes to take questions. Is there anybody who has a question that hasn't, that hasn't had an opportunity to ask a question yet? Oh, back there. Go ahead. Yes. Hello, uh, I'm Farzana from India. I just have a small, simple question. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, some vaccines are freeze dried. How do you decide on the reconstituent? What reconstituent uh, you are using for the particular vaccine? Um, so, so that's part of research and development. Uh, I said formulation is complicated. Uh, so, the development of vaccines in general is complicated. Uh, so this is uh, case by case, depending on the particularities of the of the proteins. Uh, so the, the solvent for a constitution uh, depends on the molecule that uh, that that is there. Don't know if this uh, this is a global answer, but I. Michael, Michael from Nigeria. Yeah, thank you very much um, for that lecture. So thinking about the hexavalent vaccines, since the vaccines have different schedules, yeah, how do we go about that? Thank you. So for, for the schedules, this is not, uh, so this is, uh, the, the choice, of course, uh, research and development and then clinical trials support uh, the, the schedules of the vac vaccination schedules. But then uh, this is a choice uh, that is made by countries depending on the epidemiology, depending on on a lot of uh, specificities. So this is, um, uh, let's say, uh, CDC uh, or CDC-like uh, decisions. Uh, this is vaccination policies, and uh, and, and of course, uh, depending on the product and discussion with industry, but uh, uh, authority uh, uh, decision. Ah, so then you'll have to be patient. <laughs> so um, I'll let you. Rita, go ahead. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, it's kind of a philosophical question. I think this creates a barrier to entry for like, you know, kind of smaller manufacturers into the vaccine field because the larger manufacturers have the resources to bring to bear mm -hmm. for something like this, but others won't. Yeah, that's that's a big challenge, and this is why we are only a few uh, manufacturers to, uh, today. Uh, even if again during COVID, uh, more are coming here. But uh, uh, and, and we are a few because and we are big because we are the only one to be able to absorb the cost of the manufacturing with uh, by by selling the, those vaccines worldwide uh, with volumes, let's say. So yeah, the the, the technology uh, for for the classical platform uh, with mRNA, we'll see. I don't know, uh, but but our our barrier, obviously, uh, by fact, you can observe today uh, or before COVID, uh, there were more people that were going out of the uh, the business of vaccines than people entering into it. Yes, you're in front. Right Can out. I just briefly, uh, very related to Rita's question, I mean, we just heard before that, you know, one of the goals is to go also 
uh, to allow manufacturing in countries that haven't manufactured yet, right? In Africa, but how? I have a similar question, right? How is that? How can you combine that goal with these number of tests and the requirements and thousands of pages? <laughs> the um, no, well, I, 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 yeah, no, the the. Um, let, let's clarify something. As part of the regulation, uh, don't, don't misunderstand what I said. This is complex and not harmonized. This is an issue. But this is necessary to protect patients. That's the first point. So I'm not complaining about the, the number of pages. That's not a concern. As soon as they require the same content for the dossier, which is not always the case. Uh, then in terms of country, um, I mentioned WHO network, for example, or WHO in general. Um, they encourage on purpose, uh, if this is not the local manufacturing, because this is difficult for the reasons we mentioned before, uh, they encourage um, uh, the development of, of skills and knowledge and autonomy of the countries in terms of uh, understanding uh, uh, vaccines, being able to assess a dossier or being able to make a test in the, uh, and, and the test, this was on the leaflet I showed, or this is on page two, but... Uh, uh, f for the test, uh, independent test by health authorities, uh, WHO is saying you should be able to perform the test in order, to, uh, because after release, I didn't say that authorities uh, have uh, systems in place to allow the surveillance of the market, because the markets uh, are extremely complex. Internet uh, came in the game. Uh, there could be counterfeits. So countries should be able to uh, do their own tests uh, to perform the surveillance of, of, the, of the market, to be able to. Uh, so WHO is pushing to the development of competencies uh, locally uh, to review a dossier uh, for a license or for a variation or to perform their own tests. So th there is an encouragement. Uh, but then to build a factory or to have the competencies to manage uh, manufacturing, this is uh, another challenge yeah. here. Uh, my name is Tabel. Um, I just wanted to know, with, during COVID, we saw how quickly we got to manufacture uh, vaccines. Is there anything that we can learn from that to apply to non-emergency situation, obviously without compromising um, the safety mm. to ensure a better supply of vaccines? Uh I hope so. Uh, I, I, I hope, and, and we have seen some, some move in the mentalities, uh, all parties involved, uh, to say um, we have been able uh, uh, during the pandemic to react quickly. Uh, so there was one part that was linked to mRNA uh, platform, uh, for sure, but there was one part that was linked to the cooperation, cooperation between industry and authorities, between authorities themselves, to be faster to review in parallel uh, rather than waiting to have the full dossier to start the review. So there were rolling reviews. So any things that could be done in parallel have been done uh, with always the prerequisite to respect uh, what you mentioned, uh, safety, uh, no compromise on this. So for the future or for the present or the, the, the early past, authorities uh, I, I have started to see what could be done on a regulatory point of view uh, to facilitate these cooperations. Uh, uh, including uh, to see uh, what could be uh, uh, what what benefit could be harvested from that, even for routine outside pandemic. So we are on the let, let's say the idea is here. I think there is an agreement uh, globally about the intention, but but then the transformation into acts. Uh, wait and see. I'm here in the blue. Yeah, screen. hi Gonzalo from Argentina. I understand you are organized as manufacturers in some kind of corporation, which name it has, and and are you organized to ask for this harmonization, for example, and to respond to the pandemic? For there are only big companies, or there are a lot of companies worldwide. So I'm from Sanofi Pasteur. So this is the vaccine part of Sanofi. Uh, this discussion, uh, we have it in routine since a long time as part of associations. So I'm a member personally of Vaccines Europe uh, Batch Release Expert Group. Uh, the same for IFPMA at the global level. Uh, so we are all industries cooperating with authorities, uh, asking for discussion or answering positively to ask from authorities to be around the table to, uh, to discuss. And we are participating to conferences 
to touch a big number of people at the same time, uh, trying to uh, convince that uh, dialogue is necessary and that optimization is necessary. Uh, I'm not saying that the industry has the, is right on the positions. There is always things to uh, discuss together. And this is happening as part of uh, some committees that uh, there, are, there are technical committees, interface committees between uh, authorities and, and industry associations. This is where the dialogue is happening. Yes, and back. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, just about the uh, combined vaccines. Uh, I'm just wondering, because each one of those contains a different adjuvant. And as we saw, uh, some adjuvants actually enhance immunity, immune response and some others actually dampen it. So when you combine vaccines, do you have to go back to clinical trials and how far do you go to actually make sure that actually those combined adjuvants are not actually... Uh, you know, not the vaccine. So I'm, I'm not a specialist of that, that field. Nevertheless, uh, what I can say is that um, uh, it has taken years to develop the, the, the hexavalent uh, vaccine, uh, which is in liquid form. Uh, there was the challenge of the combination of different antigens. There was the challenge of the, uh, of the formulation. There was the challenge of the stability of the product ready for injection, which is a big advantage of that, of that one. I remind you, it's probably obvious for you, that uh, these combinations are the ones, and this will make the link with the question of the schedules. Uh, I had figures, uh, and I will do by memory, but uh, uh, for the French schedule some years ago, uh, this would have needed uh, 71 injections uh, as opposed to uh, uh, something like 15 uh, due to the combination products. So combination are absolutely necessary uh, to fit to the schedules. So that means to protect the populations, uh, even if they are extremely hard uh, to develop. Uh, and uh, uh, there is the question of the adjuvants. There is the question of the stability. There is the question of uh, uh, each antigen separately could have a, 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 an efficacy and or uh, uh, toxicity. When you combine them, the, the picture could be totally different. So there is a place for uh, for clinical trials in the middle of that, uh, but I'm not a specialist. So probably, uh, if David is still here, you could ask him the the, the, the question another time. Right here in front, Sophie. Um, how does it work for flu vaccines? Do you have a, like is it a more accelerated program for, for, for flu vaccine? Uh -huh. um, uh, what, what do you mean by accelerated programs? Because the formulation changes every year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so for flu vaccines, uh, I have a specific chart for that with timelines. Uh, we, we have, uh, Sanofi Pasteur is leader in that field since many years. So we have an experience of that, uh, which means that we anticipate, we cannot wait for March, end of March, the uh, WHO uh, communicating the, the strains. So, um, we capitalize on our knowledge and we start the manufacturing in December for the two first uh, antigens that usually don't change. So uh, there is uh, experience is playing a role. Uh, so we anticipate, which means that then in March, we complete the manufacturing with the remaining antigens, being able then to make the feeding around uh, May, June, uh, and then packaging during the, the, the summer, which allows us then not to be forgotten uh, to uh, prepare uh, all the parcels uh, for expedition in different pharmacies during summer. Uh, our French site distribution center, because uh, Val d'Or in Normandy, uh, one of our sites here in France, is specialized in flu, uh, supplying uh, flu in more than 70, 80 countries. Um, uh, for, just for France, the site uh, in, in, in August to be ready for the deliveries is preparing more than 10,000 parcels. So this is how we work. Uh, and and um, uh, there is the independent testing uh, and, and release that is starting uh, uh, at the beginning of the of the summer, uh, and in between, at the time um, the, the strains are, are known, uh, we have to update the quality control methods to revalidate the process. So everything is done in parallel, and we start before the clock to be on time. That's the only way to succeed with the actual processes. Right here, the orange boss. Angelique from uh, University of Cape Town. I would like to ask, uh, how about the final cost when you have this combined vaccine? 
Is it cost effective? I know that there's a, it's a lot of effort to have those uh, type of vaccine. How does it affect the cost? Um, you have seen the number of tests, the number of pages, the, I mentioned the investment for a factory. You have seen the complexity of the submissions and so on. Uh, the, the costs are extremely high and can only be, up, and the price of the vaccines are very low compared to other uh, medicines. Uh, I think a combination product in France is 16 euros or less than 20 euros. Uh, so for three years of manufacturing, do you know any manufactured product that costs 16 <laughs> francs, uh, euros uh, that took uh, three years uh, with doctors uh, everywhere to be manufactured? No, it doesn't exist. So th this is why you are only a few able to do that. And because uh, we, we manufacture for worldwide. So the quantities absorb part of this cost. But this is a challenge, again, because this is not a given. You launch a batch, you're not sure. It will be on the market at the end because you're not sure due to the variability that it will pass uh, the, the test and the requirements. Now that this is yeah, one of the challenges I wanted to illustrate today. So if you understood this. Uh, I'll just add that sometimes the cost of the vaccine itself is less than the cost of the vaccine implementation in a program, much less. So if you can reduce the number of vials, you might have additional savings beyond the manufacturing. Um, back there in the flower, black and white. Again, uh, black and white flowers. Uh, <laughs> this, this one's good from Norway. So you mentioned that 70% um, of the time is related to QC testing. So if you think back to the previous discussion on acceleration of vaccine development and manufacturing, this is a very clear opportunity to, to accelerate. So what kind of innovations do you think are needed to reduce that 70%? That and is there a role for PAT, real-time release? What do we need to get there? Yeah, uh, so the two ones, the process analytical technology, that means uh, tests that are completed uh, in situ uh, during uh, within the, the pipes or reactor and so on, which doesn't need a sample, and you get an immediate uh, result uh, are part of the solutions. Um, the 70% I mentioned uh, are typical to uh, pertussis containing uh, combos, uh, as well as tetanus and diphtheria, uh, they require still uh, in vivo tests. Uh, these ones are the longest and the most complex uh, ones. They require um, uh, checks uh, that can reach to invalid tests and tests to be repeated. And then the, the, the duration, typical duration is, let's say, depending on the products, but approximately three months. So this is where uh, we are investing a lot in research and development to replace these methods by in vitro methods, if not uh, process analytical technology. This is necessary for the supply. This is necessary for patients. This is reducing the, the variability. This is necessary on an ethical point of view uh, to reduce the use of animals. So we now think that we are about uh, to uh, reach that objective to remove uh, the use of animals for testing in routine, at the horizon of approximately now 10 years from now on. But again, back to the complexity, never forget that uh, there is no uh, harmonization worldwide. To remove a test that is abnormal toxicity, this is a safety test, uh, it, it, has, it is not finished yet. So there are still some countries uh, requiring that test. It took more than 20 years. Uh, to get uh, an agreement across the globe to remove that test. So uh, this is still a challenge. But you are right. So we invest on the... Uh, so reducing the, the time for uh, testing with the examples that you mentioned, and in parallel, reducing the time for manufacturing by itself. Uh, and, and this is R&D again, and this is why this is so costly. We have to invest time and, and money. So I think we only have time for one more question because I don't want to cut too far into your personal reflection time. So... I'll go with um, the woman in the black sweater in here. Thank you. Black and white today was the color. Uh, ask the color for tomorrow if we want to ask questions. <laughs> um, you said that vaccines that are available today, you started manufacturing it about two, three years ago. Um, how much stability or how long of a stability data do you generate before you release the vaccine? And how much uh, more stability data do you generate, you know, post-approval or post-release or whatever? Um, so the, the shelf life of the vaccine depends on the yeah. vaccines, uh, for sure. Uh, storage conditions too, because you know, the COVID, uh, mRNA minus 70, uh, the other platforms, this is, uh, five plus or minus three degrees. 
Um, the the shelf lives are uh, for flu one year, but, but that, that fits to the, the change of the strains in any case. Uh, up to uh, three, now five years, uh, due to the progress that we have made in formulation and in different fields, uh, there are more and more vaccines that can reach now uh, longer uh, shelf lives, which is excellent because we consume part of that. The clock of the shelf life is starting uh, at formulation. Uh, and the way after formulation is often more than one to two, two years, depending on the products. So this is one of the one one of the challenge. Uh, so yeah, one to five years if lucky. The challenge actually in development is to to try uh, to uh, develop vaccines that can be stored at room temperature. That's one of the challenge. Yes. Of course, yeah, for more than one year. 